In a previous production on this channel, we looked at what it takes to install a UAvionics Skybeacon ADSB system. I'm here with uh, Paul Pelletier, A&P Paul. He's based over at Wyndham Airport in Connecticut. And since that previous production, Paul has had a chance to install a lot of the uh, UAvionics Skybeacons. Now, also since that previous production, UAvionics has got certification for a follow-on product called the Tail Beacon. And of course, it mounts up on the tail section. And uh, before we talk to Paul about the uh, nuts and bolts of putting a tail beacon on, uh, let's go talk to Mark Simmons. He operates Simmons Aviation Services here in Westerly, Rhode Island. Uh, he's a commercial operator that uh, has got a fleet of uh, banner pulling airplanes uh, and some warbirds. And like most commercial operators, He's faced with installing his entire fleet with ADS-B systems, and uh, Mark is going to tell us why he chose the UAvionics product. All right. So I'm Mark of uh, Simmons Aviation Services. We do aerial advertising with a fleet of different kinds of airplanes with Pawnees and Bird Dogs, Ag Cats, 172s, Malls, and uh, we're coming up with a problem how to meet the ADS-B uh, new requirements, and coming up on January, we're going to have a short on time to get it done. And the biggest problem is finding an avionics shop that was going to be available to uh, do the install. They're all booked up nine, 12 months in advance. And most of them don't want to mess with old, air, old equipment with old airplanes. So uh, we kept waiting for uh, the UAV product to go into a tail portion because all our airplanes have different types of wingtips and some of them weren't going to be able to utilize the, the fin on the wingtip. Uh, so we're today trying to work out how to uh, install these tail beacons on a, a range of aircraft that we have today. So we've done successfully on a bird dog, two bird dogs. Um, the mall, successful on the mall, the 172. We're going to probably mess around with the, the ag cat and maybe some of the warbird stuff that we operate and, and see how that works out. Some of the biggest problems that we have in our fleet are, are vintage warbird airplanes and they're um, pretty stock original equipment and we're finding EDSB compliant to be hard to do. Um, when wing tips are enclosed you can't use a fin and the tails are different lighting and so even to this day we're, we're trying to incorporate either the sky or the tail beacon and we're just um, that's the most economical easiest way to do it and we're still running into problems trying to do it that way. Uh, they're the, the lost airplanes that people are trying to become compliant with and if you're going to do it any other way, you could probably spend five to eight thousand dollars changing transponder and putting a GPS locator and a whole bunch of other stuff into it. it just becomes problematic. So we operate these uh, aircraft doing the advertising right along the shoreline. So typically we're below 1,500 feet. Uh, we're going to fly in um, E airspace. We're going to fly in D airspace, and sometimes we're going to go into the Charlie and Bravo airspace when we fly up towards. Um, Boston and New York when we fly some of their their games. So we'd be required to, be, to use it in the C and uh, B airspace and we don't get high enough in the E airspace to require to have it but um, I think it's going to be problematic with some of the D airspace because they're going to assume that they need to have it to get into the, some of those airspace. So we wanted to get a, ahead of it even though we're getting on at the end of the bus to make this happen. Um, our biggest concern is to get locked out of airspace when we really need to fly the mission of the aerial advertising that we're doing. Um, some of the planes we do fly long distance back and forth to Florida and to weave around all of the, the airspace is possible but uh, unrealistic because there's going to be people that are going to be flying blind looking for airplanes that have a beacon that says hey if there's no one there they can just arbitrarily fly through the sky and we're going to end up having a midair somewhere along the way because they're going to be only looking at this box on the screen. Um, so we're just trying to be compliant with all the airplanes, not just some of them or none of them because we don't have to. The, the restrictions on the airspace is, is going to be interesting because only 40, 50 percent of the fleet are covered right now and we're only 60 days away from mandatory compliance. Um, like I said, we're jumping on late, but at least we're trying to get it done before the end of the, end of the year. Well, Simmons Aviation Services uh, operates out of Westerly Airport and uh, we have three different tiers to what we do. We have an aerial advertising operation which is Banner Tow USA. We operate out of the Northeast and 
the ability to operate up and down the entire East Coast. Um, we have uh, Warbird Experience, which operates a, a T6, and we do vintage Warbird rides and parades and um, memorial services and some sky riding with that. And the third one is the HeritageFlightFoundation.org, and that's a nonprofit organization for the preservation of aviation history and education, which is the TBM Avenger. And we take that to different parts of the country to let younger people see the old parts of history and be a part of old vintage warbirds. So before we talk about uh, the tail beacon, Paul, you've had a chance to install a bunch of these systems, uh, the, the sky beacons, on a variety of airplanes. You've actually traveled the country putting these things on. There's been a big rush, as we know. What are some of the challenges and what advice might you have to somebody uh, thinking about putting a sky beacon on, what have you found? Well, um, there's a couple of things. Um, first, we need to remind people that you do need to fill out a 337 form after installing the sky beacon, and that has to be done by an IA. So it's really important that um, you fill out the, the paperwork properly for it to be ADSB compliant. The other thing is that, um, as far as UAVionics is concerned, um, they've been very responsive. You know, their units were relatively new early on. We had uh, some issues with um, wingtip fitment, um, and uh, we were able to work through that. We were making our own placards because, you know, a good AMP wants to make sure that uh, uh, that the pilot knows either in a checklist or a placard to turn on the position lights, um, and they they included those in the kit. Um, so uh, I've been very happy the the sky beacons have uh, going relatively easy. So this is the tail light here and you can see how the Grimes unit is right out in the weather and this is a new machine screw but you can see how it being out in the weather could create corrosion issues and issues to remove the unit but we were very lucky um, this uh, aircraft was maintained very well and we were able to get uh, the unit out without any problems. And uh, the 172 is the specific model that's called out in the STC. Uh, Cessna uh, gives us both a ground wire here that you can see it's white with black and uh, the power wire uh, is white with red. And so we're going we're gonna to connect um, the ground to the black wire on the tail beacon and we're going to connect uh, the red stripe to the red wire on the tail beacon. So the base plate needs to go through the wires like this and it gets mounted to the airframe like that and then using aviation approved hardware we connect these two wires and then the unit clocks into place with a 45 degree turn and the antenna needs to be mounted downwards. You know, this, uh, this operator, Simmons Aviation, has got a bunch of fabric airplanes. They're, they're Piper airplanes used for banner pulling. And in the avionics world, uh, dealing with fabric airplanes has always been sort of a challenge because of grounding issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sky Beacon isn't a piece of electronics. It needs to be grounded. Mm -hmm. How do you do that with this, uh, with this system on a, on a fabric airplane? Well, um, the, the housing is aluminum. And so what we're able to do is we're able to cap the ground wire uh, that comes out of the unit and the unit housing itself will ground it to uh, the aircraft. Um, with that said, um, uh, fabric airplanes, uh, the, the way the fabric goes into these crevices are always a little bit different and sometimes you need to cut away a little piece. So it's very important to work with somebody that um, is very familiar with fabric. Now this is a completed tail beacon installation on a Mall M7 fabric airplane. What did you run into on this one? And so for this one, um, we did speak with uh, UAVionics directly, and the housing is self-grounding. So what I did was um, we took the ground wire and we capped it with an aviation-approved cap, and, um, uh, and it's being grounded directly through its housing. Uh, and everything worked out fine because we were able to program it, and, uh, and it works fine. So now buyers have a decision to make, tail beacon, or the traditional sky beacon which mounts on the wingtip. Right. How do you make the decision? Well, um, sometimes you can't use a, a, uh, a sky beacon. They don't fit on all the wingtips. Grunman comes to, comes to mind. Um, and uh, the tail beacon is a nice unit, um, I think, from an AMP perspective because it's never shielded by a wing. Um, there are a couple issues that people might come in, in um, a couple, there 
are some issues that people might uh, find, and that is that because the, the, the tail light is out, these grime units are out in the weather, there may be corrosion issues with, with the, the machine screws. This is a new machine screw, um, and we found that if you are having trouble removing the screw, um, you can drill off the head on both of them and then remove the unit and then use some penetrating oil with, a little, with some pliers um, to get them out that way. And uh, we'll stress here that the concept for the tail beacon is the same as a sky beacon. You're using the existing lighting, that, uh, lighting wires that run up to the tail, yeah. power and grounds, the two wires. Yeah, it's two, two wires. Larry, uh, there's a ground wire and a power wire. The power wire is used to uh, power both the, uh, the tail light, the position light, uh, as well as the ADSB unit. And uh, also worth stressing is that the tail beacon uh, is a little bit different than the sky beacon where it doesn't have a strobe light. That's right, it doesn't have a strobe light and um, um, that, has been a, that has been an issue with the sky beacon. Some airplanes um, that that do have strobes, you need 12 volts going to the sky beacon. So the, the tail beacon is actually a, a better unit for that situation because there's a lot less wiring, Larry. And the programming is the same as it ever was. Uh, it makes a hotspot that um, your phone registers and it's smart. The only difference between this unit and the sky beacon unit is that the sky beacon unit has uh, an option for a strobe. Well, the tail, the tail lights don't have strobes, and so um, um, it doesn't give you that option in the, in the app. So from that perspective, it's user-friendly. And the rest of the steps are, are, are as uh, we've done in the past. The app asks you the IKO code, the N number, and it brings you through a, uh, a series of steps. Um, light aircraft uh, for, for most of these small uh, airplanes and um, the the measurements have already been done by sky beacons uh, by UAvionics so um, you don't need to change those and uh, our thanks go to a and p Paul at Wyndham Airport in Connecticut for uh, helping with another ADSB field report and uh, we're also grateful to Mark Simmons at Simmons Aviation here in uh, Westerly Rhode Island for uh, allowing us to film his fleet. You can look for a full report on a tail beacon installation in an upcoming issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine. For Aviation Consumer, I'm Larry Anglosano. Thanks for watching.